Please join me in welcoming hey. Sanju Benzol of MicroStrategy. How's it going? Feels good to be here, and uh, thanks for having me for a trip down memory lane. Oh, no problem, no problem. We're so I'm, I'm like all these young folks who are starting companies now, you know, like my startup story goes back a while, so it's going to be fun to reminisce. Sure. Awesome. Awesome. So we're so happy to have you here. I mean, I, I, I drive down 495 all the time and uh, I see MicroStrategy building like almost every day. So I'm like so excited to have the founder right, right next to me. So thank you for coming out. The, the, build, okay. the building is all part of the marketing. Okay. So we always like to start off our uh, fireside chat uh, on a personal note. So if you can kind of like um, talk about, you know, where you were born, um, where you were raised, what did your parents do? Uh, and then maybe talk about an entrepreneur's story where you kind of hustle somebody off of a penny or something. I don't know. T talk about that. So. <laughs> Uh, okay, sure. So I was born in northern India. Uh, my parents are first generation. I'm first generation, I guess, since I was born in northern India. Uh, my father uh, studied at Howard University here locally. And uh, the reason that's sort of funny is um, if, if you've ever been around first generation Indians, they have a bit of an accent. And so my dad used to say, you know, I went to Harvard University. And so until I was about 10, I thought he went to Harvard <laughs> University. And I was really proud of him for having gone to Harvard. I was like, my dad went to Harvard. And he said, no, 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 it's Howard. I was like, oh, OK, I don't know what that is. So, uh, but he studied engineering, went back, got married, had me, and then I came over when I was two years old. So born in India, raised in the DC area, so I'm kind of a DC pseudo-native, and grew up in uh, the Burbs, uh, Alexandria, Springfield, and then in McLean. Um, so just grew up locally. So, so you have a heart for DC and no other place that you ever considered going uh, to? I would love to be no place other than DC. Oh, so, really? Yeah, so a uh, big fan. I, I actually split my time between McLean, where I have my primary residence, and Georgetown, where I spend my weekends. It's awesome. It's like I yeah. uh, have a hotel there. <laughs> um, so let's, let's, uh, let's, let's go right into the MicroStrategy story here. Um, you know, step us through the story of how MicroStrategy get, got started, you know, you know what, how, come, how did it come to be, and then like, how did you meet Michael Saylor? And, uh, and why did you guys decide to do a BI startup when you could have done other startups? So let's go to that story. Yeah, sure. There's, there's, a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of history there. So um, after graduating here locally, I went to public school, Lake Braddock Secondary School in Burke, Virginia. Uh, went to MIT. And so it's just you know, kind of a good place to go if you care about engineering. And again, if you have Indian parents, you've got two options, doctor or engineer. Those are like the, the two things you can do. And so um, decided to go for engineering. Uh, you had asked before about sort of startup moments. And so even before we get to the MicroStrategy story, um, one of the things you believe when you're an entrepreneur is that if you have a better idea, that somehow it's going to make a difference and everything else will fall into place. So my, bet, my first better idea uh, was I went to India on one of, one of my normal travels to India. And I tasted something called cold coffee, which is pretty popular there. And I came back and said, look, I need to do cold coffee in the United States. Like, this is something that doesn't exist. Nobody has it. This is well before Frappuccinos were popular at Starbucks. And so uh, I was at MIT, electrical engineer, in the lab with notebooks. And I went through about 120 recipes for cold coffee. And I tried them on my fraternity brothers. I tried them when I was back home for spring break on my mom. Um, and everybody was like caffeinated up beyond belief. And I started selling uh, cold coffee at the MIT Student Center. And it was reasonably popular. We went through uh, probably a couple hundred dollars worth of cold coffee in the first two weeks. And it started to kind of catch. And then you start to look at the cost of production, uh, what you're selling it for. And you start to realize the, the better idea is not really the issue. It's like distribution is going to be a problem. And so my first failed startup was my cold coffee startup which sort of worked successfully through the student union, but you start to think about distribution. You're like, I don't know how I'm ever going to get to the point of getting broad distribution. And so you learn very early on that having a great idea and even having a better invention doesn't really help if you don't have distribution licked. And so you kind of get slapped with that you know, pretty early, even if you, if, you, if you put in a lot of work. But at MIT, uh, I did meet Mike Saylor. We were, uh, we were classmates and fraternity brothers. And uh, one of the things about Mike uh, which I think is interesting as you think about partnership with somebody, 
is he, yeah, I get, I've had a chance to meet a lot of smart people in my life through academia, uh, through professional life, and just through friendships. And he's probably in the top five of smart guys that I know. The guy's just, uh, he's wickedly brilliant and incredibly quick. And so uh, it's always good to work with people smarter than you. I mean, it just is. Yeah, in general, if you can hire either a partner or hire people for you that are smarter than you, that's great. So I got lucky that I somehow convinced him that we should work together. And he, the way Mike is, it needs to feel like it's his idea. And I remember when we started up MicroStrategy, he said, Sanjay, I think you'd make a great partner because people like you and people think I'm smart. And I was thinking, I don't know if that was a compliment <laughs> or not. But somewhere in there was a compliment. And I think, I think it, it sort of worked out. And uh, he certainly is an incredibly uh, bright and creative individual. Oh, we'll, we'll definitely cover those about <laughs> co-founders. We'll definitely cover that. But um, uh, before that, um, I know that there was, there was an article out there that had said that MicroStrategy was based off a class at MIT yeah. Um, on non-linear mathematics. And I'm like, what is that? So why don't you explain? What was it about this class? Sure. What did they teach? And how was that the basis for MicroStrategy? Yeah, so uh, as, uh, if you go to Sloan School at MIT, which is the business school, and so you know, if you're a precocious undergrad, you're like, yeah, I'm done with this undergrad stuff. I want to go study at the Sloan School. Um, there's a class that's taught by one of the electrical engineering professors. It's called System Dynamics Theory, and it's the application of nonlinear mathematics to business situations, political systems, economic systems. And the idea is that instead of doing linear optimization or other optimization math, which is all about sort of optimizing matrices, what you do is you create more dynamic simulations about how the world really operates. And it's sort of an emerging view of how to model systems that's not about optimization, it's more about understanding. So it's nonlinear math based, it's good for spring mass systems. If you're a mechanical engineer, it's good for capacitive circuits. If you're an electrical engineer, but it's also good for understanding population dynamics or economic systems. Anyway, there's math involved. It's good for understanding social and economic systems. I took the class. Mike Saylor also took the class separately. And we're like, this is a pretty interesting thought process of how to understand business systems. So the idea of microstrategy was not business intelligence or data mining, but rather how do we model business systems using nonlinear mathematics. So the first four years that we were in business, we went to large corporations and we said something really geeky, because we were 24 years old, we didn't know any better. We would like to model your biggest, most complicated problems using nonlinear ma non mathematics to help you understand them better. And people would look at us like, what the heck are you talking about? Like, you know, wh what does that mean? And we'd try to translate it in a way that made some sense. And we did get some people to buy into that concept. But the idea was, instead of, uh, when I graduated, I went to Booz Allen and Hamilton in New York as a management consultant. And so we would go and do studies for people. You spend six months, you do a management consulting study. Typically, you're going to buy a firm, divest a firm, do something. You make a big strategic decision. The idea was instead of helping people by doing a study and giving them an answer, right answer, wrong answer, you would ideally set up a simulation where they can run tons and tons of scenarios on their own and then come to their own understanding of what a good answer is. And so that was the founding principle behind MicroStrategy. Okay. Um, so so that's, that's, that's quite interesting. I mean, like, uh, back to Michael Saylor's and uh, his consulting contract, um, you, this is a very intriguing story because he, he got the, his first contract through DuPont, right. which they said, hey, here's $250,000, which he took 100000 of that, uh, set up an office. And then that's, this is where, this is where this is the inflection point where it just intrigues me. He could have, like, said, I'm going to do this myself. I don't need a co-founder. Was it, was it during this time when he was doing it alone, or was this, were you involved when he had that DuPont contract? Yeah, so uh, Mike was at a consulting firm. Yeah. He had a client, which is DuPont, and they, he, he effectively said, I could do this without the consulting firm. I could do it myself for DuPont. He went in-house at DuPont initially and then spun out of DuPont. So it's kind of this entrepreneurship, intrapreneurship idea. I'll get to that. Yeah. Of, you know, basically you're inside a company, you have a good idea, maybe you can get them to finance your good idea and spin out a company of your own. Yeah, so the question here though is that, uh, uh, were you a co-founder then when, when, when they had the DuPont, when you guys had the DuPont contract? Or did he approach you? Right. Yeah. So as my, Mike Saylor was inside DuPont and he said, I'm going to spin out, at the point that he decided to spin out, he said, I'm going to need help. Okay. And so he came down and, and to D.C. where I was at the time and uh, we, got, we got it started. So, so that's, that's, 
So this, that, this, this is the question because, um, you know, finding a co-founder, and there's so, many, there's so many founders here that are in that position. Uh, they're saying, well, do I find a co-founder? I mean, I'm, I'm going to find a co-founder because I'm told to do that. But, um, you know, in his case, it was like, well, I need to find a co-founder because I lack certain skills and I need to find somebody to compensate for that. So they always say, it's, it's been said that finding a co-founder is almost akin to finding a wife. And um, maybe more important. Right. And I got to be very careful with this question because my wife is actually here. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's, she's, oh, there she is. Okay. Hi, honey. Um, and so, so what did you see in Michael? And what, what did Michael see in you? And what did, Mike, uh, what did you see in Mike? So let's, let's talk I'll, about that. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll up-level the conversation for a second and say I, th I think getting a co-founder for any endeavor is important, just like having a spouse is important in the sense that you need, you're gonna have lots of ups and downs, there's no doubt. In starting a business, probably a lot more downs than ups initially, there's just, it's tough. And so having a sounding board, having the emotional support, having somebody to, to kind of perk you up and tell you you're not dumb, or to tell you you are dumb when you're flying high and maybe too high, is really important. So you need somebody who's gonna be very trusted, where you've got sort of some simpatico thing going. And so that trust in that relationship, just like a marriage, is critically important in getting something started. So in the companies that I have funded or financed, I've always said, let's try to figure out what the founding team, typically the top two guys look like. What's their relationship? Do they have good chemistry? Do they have history? Do they know each other? Do they trust each other? Because inevitably, I found the best startups tend to be kind of a, a, a duo that work well together. Mm -hmm. Because again, you, know, you keep one person from going too far off the deep end by having uh, a counterbalance. So do you think uh, have finding a, a best friend as a co-founder is a good idea, or what do you um, think? I'm not sure I'd recommend best friend. I mean, uh, you know, best, best friend doesn't imply intellectual superiority or intellectual um, competence. It doesn't imply great chemistry. It just implies maybe a guy that you would go out with or a gal you would go out with and have fun with. So I'd pick somebody who's an intellectual peer and is an intellectual partner uh, I don't know that best friend would be my, my first recommendation. Uh, you mentioned about this uh, entrepreneur, and that's actually uh, Reggie um, Agarwal from Cvent. Yeah. Um, he, he was a guest of ours, and he had, he had coined up that term, I guess. And I, what I really liked about that was, you know, this whole concept of entrepreneur, where it's an entrepreneurial employee inside of a larger corporation, and basically you will spin off these ideas whether within the organization or as a startup. So what is your opinion about that? Do you think that's a better way of uh, going about the startup route of like, hey, being sort of a consultant um, and spinning off idea within the corporation or as a startup, what do you think? I'd frame it a little bit differently, which is to say that um, ideas are a dime a dozen. We all have ideas. You, know, you sit down and, and you, know, you wake up in the morning and you might have 10 ideas. We, we all have plenty of ideas. And there's a long way from idea to execution. And to the extent that you've got a corporate umbrella or a corporate shield that says, hey, it's a good idea, there's something that we need, and they're going to fund it, that helps you a lot in terms of the execution path. So I think that, um, like I said, ideas are easy. You, know, you, you, you walk down the street, you're going to get 10 ideas for something that's interesting. The issue is, do you have people to fund it? Do they give you resources and access to resources to make the idea come, come alive? And in that context, I think that entrepreneurship can be valuable. Typically, you've got a corporate parent, they've got a need, they have resources, they can connect you to other resources that'll be useful for you to prosecute your idea. So I like that as a risk mitigation strategy. I like the idea of entrepreneurship for risk mitigation. Yeah, I mean, uh, we had Nigel Morris here uh, a couple of months ago, and yeah. his idea, Capital One actually started for this entrepreneur. They actually took over a credit card business and the, the child got bigger than the parent. Yeah. And so the, uh, it was more the bankers were saying, hey, would you like to spin this off as a company? So, and, you know, props to him. It became a $21 billion company. That's great. Um, so actually I wanted to see people here in the room, um, like how many here are actual, are actual consultants in a large corporation? So if you're a consultant, an independent consultant in the government, like, or Fortune 500, raise your hand. Okay, so how many people here actually 
started their, their startup because of an idea that they found inside of the organization. So did, they, okay, cool. I mean, I mean, I'm just saying these yeah, are potential great. Microsoft or micro strategy, sorry, micro yeah. strategy companies here. It, so it's great risk <laughs> mitigation. So, yeah. um, I wanted to go into the topic of, um, of bootstrapping versus raising capital. Um, I heard that micro strategy is 100% bootstrapped. Is that is that correct? We did. I think we're one of a handful, maybe uh, five or six co software companies that have gone from zero to IPO without raising any funding. Okay, so why didn't you go after venture funding? Uh, yeah. So let's talk about that. Well, fu funding is great, and it's, it's funny how the culture has changed a lot, um, I'd say post-96, post-97. So this goes back a decade. Uh, we started MicroStrategy in 89, and the truth is for the first seven or eight years, we were so ignorant that we didn't know that venture capital existed. And that's another way of saying venture capital was not popular as a funding mechanism in the early 90s. It became popular in the late 90s and, of course, is super popular today. Where now when you hear entrepreneurs talk about their aspiration, they say, my aspiration is to raise money, which seems like an odd aspiration as I hear it. Which, you know, like, that's not your aspiration. Your aspiration is to serve customers or to, to change the world or do something else. But they talk about raising money as a, as a massive event and something to aspire to. And that's fine, you know, there, there's, there's a role for raising money and there's a reason that people do it. Uh, we took a different path, which is, if you think about the hierarchy of financing, uh, I think the best financing, if you can get it, is customer financing. So number one, if, if you can go and find customers, spend all your energy and time, go sell customers, you know, iterate your idea and get somebody to pay you for an idea, that's great. So customer financing in my book is the number one kind of financing that you ought to try to get. Just so, like DuPont, right? The just DuPont. like DuPont. So, you know, you iterate an idea, you go sell it to them. They tell you, yeah, it's kind of stupid, but if you change it this way or that way, it might be good enough and then we'll go ahead and pay you for it. So that's number one. And that's, uh, in my opinion, the cheapest capital you can get, which is customer financing, because they're also going to help you with requirements, et cetera. Uh, number two, uh, in addition to customer financing, because it's often not enough, I would say add employee financing. And so what we did is we said, look, we don't have that much money. Uh, we're going to pay you guys rock bottom salaries. We're going to give you some equity. But basically what you're doing is using employees and their sweat equity to finance the company. So we were famous, infamous, and you know, people do this all the time. But the first six years of MicroStrategy, I'd say the average work week was about 90 to 100 hours a week. And we we're paying people 20 to 25 grand a year, it's basically substance wages in order to work for us. And they would do it because of the dream. They do it because of the vision. They do it for a little bit of equity, but frankly, not even that much equity. Um, a lot of it was, it was employee finance. We had customer financing, and we had employee financing. Now, employee financing is a little bit more expensive in the sense that you might have to give up some equity. You maybe burn out your staff. Like, it, it can get more expensive than customer financing, which is, I think, the cheapest. If you can't get enough customer financing or enough employee financing, then you might go out for institutional financing, professional venture financing or other financing. And even there, you might go friends and family first, and then you might go to true venture capital folks. And I, look, uh, I invest in companies. I have, you know, you might say I'm, I'm an I'm a, uh, amateur venture capitalist it's at some level. So I've got nothing against venture capital, but I would say it's a very expensive form of financing. And so if you talk to any venture capitalist, you look at the returns for the last decade, Venture capital returns are, are high single digits at best. Typically, any VC will tell you for every, you know, every success, there's sort of eight or 10 failures. And so they're using the massive success to finance all the failures. And so even if you're one of those successful companies, what you're doing with your success is financing the other 80% failures that a venture capitalist will have. So on your back is riding the failures and the financing of the failures of all the other companies that a VC has. So I would just say it's very expensive financing, whether you know it or not. And so uh, my, my, uh, my advice is, maybe the hierarchy would be customer financing, employee financing. I didn't really talk about debt financing. Debt financing is a lot cheaper than venture capital financing. So if you can get somebody to give you a 5% or 10% coupon or even a 15% coupon set of debt, you think you can pay it off, which hopefully you can at some point. Go for the loan instead of going for the cat, you know, the, the equity financing. Or, or do what Reggie did from Cvent. He uh, put it on like 50 credit cards. That's right. That's what he did. Yeah. Well, he sort of did that, and then he came to me. So. <laughs>
That's good to know. Um, so let's 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 talk about uh, uh, customer acquisition. So when MicroStrategy, MicroStrategy when they first got their customer, I know it's Dupont, but then uh, the popular one that that's been you know written on articles is the McDonald's oh, yeah. contract. So tell us about how you know how you got that that contract. Did you uh, did you rely on previous relationships? Did you get an introduction by a mentor, I don't know, uh, a, a, an advisor that you guys were working with, like kind of give us some sort of advice that maybe some startup out here can get a uh, McDonald's contract. Sure, sure, so uh, I think the, the question is really, are there any tips on customer acquisition? How do, how do you go out and get customers? What should you do to get customers? So um, without getting into a convoluted story, I would say that uh, one of the great things that we were able to do in the early stages of MicroStrategy is that we were, uh, we, we thought differently a bit and we standardized all of our work on Macintosh computers, Apple Macintosh computers, and this was in the early 90s when that was kind of not really that cool. Like everybody was on DOS and Windows machines, but we were doing everything on the Apple Macintosh. And the reason I bring that up is we became one of the best Macintosh development shops in the world and we became very good at selling to corporate clients. So at that point, if you remember, Apple was good in the educational market. They're kind of good in non-corporate markets, but we had something that was interesting for corporate buyers. What we did is we cultivated an entire national network of Apple sales reps that had to call on big corporations and said, if you're calling on a big corporation, you have very little software that runs on a Macintosh, give us a call and we have great demonstrations for you. So what's the principle here? We always, and we've done this at MicroStrategy, when you've got something, you know, of course be great at it, but then find a channel that's bigger than you that benefits from embedding you in that channel. So in this case, Apple had some decent relationships, big corporations. We had something to offer them so they would carry us into their clients because we were good at what we did. And so the idea of being great at something and then finding somebody who's bigger than you with better distribution than you to carry you in is useful. So how did that pan out? We did a lot of work for DuPont initially. We got known by the Apple uh, salesperson at DuPont. And he used to be at these sales conferences for Apple and say, these guys at MicroStrategy in Delaware are selling the crap out of the Apple Macintosh and we're kicking the butt of Windows and you know, Microsoft, which didn't happen that often, but you know, it, ha it happened a little bit there. And so people would hear the story and say, hey, you know, I'm the rep for McDonald's, I'm the rep for General Electric. Put me in touch with those guys that are helping you get that done. So through the Apple network, we got introduced to about 20 big corporate clients. And it's just because we were good and we sort of embedded ourselves or ingratiated ourselves to the Apple network of salespeople. So as a piece of advice, you know, find a channel that's bigger than you, be great at what you do, embed yourself in the channel, and let them carry you wherever they're going to go. Sort of like Google for entrepreneurs with a with startup grant. So, something like something that. Something like that. Well, that's that's great. Um, so let's, you know, now we're still on the topic of uh, customer acquisition. Like, can you talk about some of the techniques to keep your customer loyal to your brand? I know MicroStrategy is, it's all about that, right? I mean, selling a <laughs> software and then upselling them, right, for, uh, on more do, stuff. Do, do great work. Uh, I, I don't know what I mean. I don't know what to say other than do great work and do. Uh, great work every day. I mean, I, I, I really, I'm of the belief that uh, in general, everybody's well-meaning, but I do think you can outwork everybody. You can outsmart and outwork everybody with a little bit of focus. And so uh, with a few extra hours and a little bit more focus, you can always do better than the next guy. And so just you know, outwork the next guy and just do a little bit better. And it's, it sounds easy, you gotta do it every day, but it's, it's not that hard to do. It's not that hard to do. Not that hard. <laughs> it's only six hundred fifty million dollars later, right? Yeah, it's Not only eighty hard. hours a week. <laughs> so, um, so let I'd like to start um, talking. I like to start talking about the like indust industrial topics. Um, a lot of folks here, startups are in big data. So, um, how, 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 how many folks are interested in big data? Just so I have a sense of maybe a third. Yeah. Okay, because you guys were big data before it became sexy, right? I mean, it's, right. you were big data. Um, so if you can, I'm, I'm going to get a little bit technical here, but like, what is big data and how is it different from business intelligence? Sure. 
Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, talk about big data, and we love the McKinsey guys. So McKinsey Global Institute, three years ago, put out a report on big data, and they popularized the term big data, which I love the dumbing down of sort of this massive data movement to two words, big data. And it's, it's by packaging in that way, they popularized the concept. And so hopefully all of you have read in various publications, including foreign affairs and et cetera, all you know, the rise of big data. Great. Uh, for folks that have been in the industry the last 20 years, we sort of laugh at the term big data, and we think it's, you know, it doesn't really mean that much, and it's not that meaningful. But I do think that this notion of more data being collected and more insight to be gained is an important megatrend, and we, MicroStrategy, for the last 20 years have capitalized on the megatrend. Um, to give you a sense of the rise of data, and you hear these things all the time, but just, you know, just to put a face on it, uh, at McDonald's, which is what you asked about, uh, they had one of the world's largest commercial databases in 1994, and that was running about 100 gigabytes in size. And so it's, it was big. At that point, it was kind of a big thing. Now you could put it on a few thumb drives. You know, like, you know, it's, you get, now get 16 gig thumb drives, so you put eight of them together, and you could hold the entire McDonald's commercial database. But at that time, it was considered one of the biggest industrial databases in the world. Uh, today, I would say our largest client in terms of database size is eBay. Uh, eBay has right now about 18 petabytes of active data that they query uh, using our tool set. And so for those of you that are not in big data, I would just say data is a little bit like, um, it's like building a building. You know, anybody can build a two-story house, even I, who know nothing about engineering and architecture could probably build a two-story house. But once you go from a couple gig of data to petabytes of data, it's like building a 100-story sky skyscraper. You need real civil engineering skills, you need hard hats, you need guys that are trained professionals. And I would say anytime you go above about 100 terabytes, you need massive expertise. And these guys are at 100x that, you know, in terms of data set size. So uh, data is growing vastly. You know, there's no doubt data is growing vastly. That's, that's a, you know, it's, it's known to everybody. I think that there are a few um, massive opportunities, I shouldn't say a few, there are thousands of massive opportunities in big data, but one of the real big changes that we're seeing is the transition from causation to correlation. So it used to be that everybody wanted to understand exactly why something happened. So when you have small data and you're like, you know, trying to understand the meaning of life or the meaning of your business or how things operate, everybody's like, I've got to figure out why when A happens, B also happens, causality. What's going on with big data, which I think is sort of interesting and kind of exciting, is people are saying, maybe I don't need to worry about causality anymore, which is if, the, if a car breaks down 100 times and it's correlated to five other conditions, maybe causality doesn't matter at all. Just the mere correlation matters. And so if one, any of these five conditions show up, then maybe I should actually replace my something in the car, get it repaired, do whatever, because it's likely that something else will happen. So there is a big transition with our leading edge clients who are thinking before causality was everything. I have to understand exactly why when A happens, B happens. Now they're saying, I kind of don't care why, I just care that the two are correlated and the correlation alone is reason to act. You know, when I see A, then I do something with B, even if I don't know that there's cause, a causal relationship. So I think that's gonna open up a new way for people to act and behave because they're working on this issue of, of correlation, not just causation. The other point I'll make about big data, and so, sorry to get a little bit deep on it, but the other point I'll make oh, about, good. about big data is that um, people wax philosophic about big data. They get comfort saying there's got to be opportunity in big data. Uh, I take a little bit of an opposite view, which is uh, I actually think the real opportunity is in small data, okay, which is how do I take terabytes or petabytes of information and aggregate it, twist it, transform it to small data, gigabytes of actionable data. And uh, that's the hard problem that we're facing in the industry right now, which is how do we take many, many petabytes of data and then go through an aggregation, some synthesis, and some manipulation to get to small data that I can actually interpret and act upon. And so uh, I, I spoke at the, uh, the UK Big Data Conference about two months ago, and this issue of how do you go from big data to small data, which I think is not getting enough airplay, is really the framing question for a lot of our clients. And that is, I've got big data, big deal. The question is, how do I make it small, actionable data so I can do something? And we're spending most of our time, I'd say 70% of client budgets 
are on that tr aggregation and transformation from big into small and small and actionable. Yes, actually, I did see that uh, video of that. <laughs> and uh, what I th thought that was very um, intriguing was that uh, you had drawn the comparison of uh, back in the, I think in the 80s, where um, Excel spreadsheets, um, you know, Excel spreadsheet with Microsoft, and then, you know, you, you could just do a self-service uh, yeah. spreadsheet. You can, uh, you can do it yourself. So all the executives are like, wow, this is awesome. And then PowerPoint, wow, I, I don't need to hire an IT guy to build this presentation. So same thing with uh, big data, where now there's a self-service mechanism there where you don't need to hire a, so to speak, like, sort of like a data scientist. Right. You can do it yourself, self-service. So that was, to talk about that actually, how that's yeah. disrupting. What, what Brian's the referring to is that um, one, one of the self-critiques that I give our industry, and look, we've, we've been in, in, the, in the industry, we have some 60 or 70 patents in the industry, and so we're, at, we're to blame as anybody else is for any failures of the industry. One of the failures in our industry, and we've been at it now for two decades, is that uh, it's relatively difficult for a lay person, a business person, who is not an IT specialist to get any value out of big data. I mean, it's, it's tough, it's work, it's a lot of hard work. And so I think that finally the tooling is getting good enough, the aggregation of tools, the collection of tools are getting good enough that we're starting to see a material de-skilling of what it takes to get some advantage out of big data. So Brian's referring to this analogy that, uh, that I guess I used at this conference, which is just like you don't call on IT to develop your spreadsheets, you can do your own spreadsheets. I hope you, know, you don't need IT staff around. And just like you don't call an IT person to do your PowerPoint presentations, for the first time, I feel like last year, this year, we're, we're, we're turning the corner in the industry where you maybe don't need to call on an IT person, a, 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 techno, a, a technologist or a technical specialist to start to get value out of big data. And so we're at the early stages of a transition from it being part of the, the digerati or you know, you know, the, a technocrat skill to being kind of a mere mortal, mere mortal skill that we can all participate in. But we still have more work in the industry to improve the tooling so any of us could wake up one day and say, hey, I want to surf a few terabytes of data and get some value out of it. You know, it's funny because you were using the word dashboarding a lot, like dashboarding, and that's yeah. a big term that when I was working in a government contract, they're like, can we do a dashboard? Let's do a dashboard. Yeah. So that was, that, was a, that, was, that was a really interesting project. Um, let's talk about like the shortcomings of big data uh, in regards to say maybe privacy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the one thing that I'd, I'd, I'd like to talk about is, you know, is it, I mean, these, these companies that have big data projects, I mean, how do they do that, the balance between, you know, trying to optimize on profit as opposed to compromising user privacy? Yeah, so there, there's no one answer there. I'd say privacy is a, is a mega concern. You know, cybersecurity, privacy, you know, kind of the, the, the entire, and I, I separate them, but I will just say this entire issue of data security and privacy are interrelated and they're complicated, very uh, difficult technical and societal topics to take on. But in general, I would say I'm sort of a techno-optimist, and what that means is that um, the world has always evolved. Technologies are always coming, the world's evolving, technologies are getting better, and, uh, and we find a way because we are human and we are social. What I mean by that is we, we, we want to interoperate in a way that is comfortable for all of us. We find a way to evolve our behavior and our rules within our civilization to deal with new technology and take advantage of the opportunity of new technology. So an example that you know, we've used before is, you can imagine when cars first came out, people were driving all over God's creation, through fields, whatever, and uh, you, know, you drive anywhere you want. There are no roads. You do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. And then some people said, you know, this is starting to get dangerous in the middle of a town. We need to put up stoplights. We need to stop people so other people can pass. And at first, people were like, oh, that's a violation of my rights. My civil rights are being impeded upon because you're making me stop. Well, you do it because you need to let, you need to interoperate or cooperate with other people. And so there is some impinging of personal rights or personal freedoms in order to operate within a society. And that's been true forever. I think that we're going to have an ongoing generational debate about privacy rights. There's going to be government intervention. There'll be government regulation and legislation. There'll be societal norms that will get, that will evolve too. And you're seeing this played out in the Facebook world every single day. But with all that struggle which goes on and the back and forth that goes on, 
it's all short term. That is, we will sort it out. Our civilization, because we are human, we are civil, we are social, we want to work it out, and we will work it out. The government will react, uh, people will react, we'll have social norms. And so I think that technology marches on, privacy is a concern as it relates to big data. It's maybe the flip side, as you indicate, of big data. But the truth is, we will all figure it out, and it'll happen in some reasonably orderly process over not that long a period of time, maybe a generation. No, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I really want to talk more about this, but I, we're running out of time. I mean, it sounds like the bottom line is it's going gonna, it's gonna to figure itself, itself out. Governance, government will know when to step in, I think, um, yeah. and, and take care of itself. Let's talk about, like, social media and monetization, and more specifically, microstrategy in Facebook. Because um, I know Cheryl, Cheryl Sandberg, she's the, you know, obviously the CEO of fa Facebook. She's a good friend of Michael Saylor, uh, partly because of her involvement with the uh, Clinton administration, uh, maybe you know, 10, 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And there was a CNN article that talked about microstrategy almost being the mission critical infrastructure tool for Facebook. And so my question to you is, um, how is, how is how are you helping Facebook monetize on its billion user? Like, how are you <laughs> filling the gap in terms of their monetization strategy? So, sure, just uh, uh, maybe a little bit of background. So, uh, we had already been doing work with MySpace, which even sounds funny to say now because nobody thinks about MySpace anymore, and LinkedIn, which were two early uh, networks. And uh, we saw the early potential at Facebook, uh, which Cheryl went over to. And so we approached her and said, hey, we think you've got something great here. We know that you're not that big yet. I think there were three or 400 people at the time, but you're onto something big. What we'd like to do is have you adopt MicroStrategy. We'll give you a little bit of an of a incentive to do so. And as you grow, you'll make it up to us. And so we have become an important reporting and dashboarding backbone at Facebook. I think they say there are now sort of 30 or so mission critical applications for them to monitor what's going on within the network that are all written on top of MicroStrategy. They've got an entire MicroStrategy team that works at Facebook. They've got their own blog and everything. It's actually pretty cool. The guys are wicked smart. They're great. Um, and that's internal reporting and operations optimization at Facebook. And I think that's part A, and that's been, in general, uh, a good success. Um, part B, which I think is what you're, what you're really asking about, is um, Facebook, of course, has been on this charge to to make some money, you know, like they, you know, how, do you, how do you monetize this 1.1 billion person network? And obviously the strategy is advertising. And so I think we, you know, being guys that know how to mine big data are, are an important player there. You know, we, we have a role to play. So we, what we did is uh, we, we uh, came up with a few ideas of how it is that you might take and arm the sales force at Facebook. They have about 400 people that go and call on chief marketing officers of large global brands like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, McDonald's, et cetera. And what they're trying to do is get those CMOs to spend 10 to $100 million buying Facebook advertising. You know, that, that would be their charge. Like go up and sign, sign a $50 million ad contract on Facebook. It would be useful uh, if I were a CMO when somebody came to call on me if you actually brought me some insight about where I should advertise. So instead of just saying, hey, Facebook's great, advertise on Facebook, you know, I'm not going to write you a $50 million check by you saying that alone. Show me something interesting. So what would be interesting? Well, if I'm the uh, Pepsi chief marketing officer, if you come to me and say, hey, uh, based on some research, it looks like uh, there's a huge contingent of people that are soda lovers. Maybe they, they liked Mountain Dew or they have liked uh, Dr. Pepper. They haven't picked a cola. They haven't picked Coca-Cola. They haven't picked Pepsi. And there's an opportunity to target them because they're sort of undecided on their cola preference, but they are big soft drink drinkers. And we can circle them, and the, you know, that number is 40 million people on Facebook. And you know, demographically speaking, here's the number of male, here's the number of female, here's their income range. Go after the medium income or high income guys. Well, the truth is you can do all that with a little bit of data mining on the Facebook social graph. That's all very possible and relatively easy to do if you know how to do it. And so what we've done is we've helped the Facebook sales force by arming them with tools that sit on their iPad. They go into a CMO's office and say, we've got three or four hypotheses of where it is that you could spend 10 or $20 million efficiently to reach an audience. And real time in the meeting, 
in that meeting with the CMO, they'll actually go through some of these Venn diagram sets. The whole self-service thing. Self-service thing. And they'll spit out and say, here are 40 million people you can target. Do you want to, do you want to hit the bid and buy that ad space? And somebody will be like, wow, nobody else shows me that. Everybody else just comes and say, says, you know, buy, buy a sort of blanket demographic or buy a TV show and you'll maybe hit the demographic. Here are people going with very precise marketing proposals or ad spend proposals. And so that tool you know, has been in the, uh, in the Facebook sales team's hands for a little while now. We think it's having some good effect. We're hearing good, good things back about it. And so uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. If you go to our homepage, that's not a plug, but if, you, if you're interested in this, if you go to the MicroStrategy homepage, there is a video on our homepage right now which uh, shows the head of analytics at Facebook speaking at our annual conference, which was just in Barcelona four weeks ago. And he did, he did a 10 minute overview of what we're doing for Facebook. And so if you have any interest in what kind of analytics they use, how they go about it, he gives you a pretty good overview of what they do. Wow. <laughs> so um, we're running out of time here, but uh, I want to cover one more topic here. Um, and that's basic, and then we always cover this topic with all of our speakers, but it's the DC startup ecosystem. Yeah. Um, what, you know, in the beginning days, you were in Delaware, and Michael Saylor was like, I could either take a right to New York or I can take a left into DC. So what are some of the benefits for taking that left yeah. in DC from where you were? Like, why did you guys pick DC? Sure. D when, I, when I say DC, I meant, you know, the um, DMV area, right? Yeah. You know, DC, Maryland, uh, Virginia. So what, what were some of the benefits for keeping MicroStrategy here in the, the DMV sure. area? Great question. So we, we were in Delaware for our first four years because DuPont was our first big paying customer. So, you know, we, we were close to our customer. And at some point, um, it was we were starting to grow and we needed to be in a place where we could grow effectively. And so you can imagine, I was going and recruiting at you know, Harvard, Dartmouth, MIT, and we would issue offers to top 5% guys, and they'd all have chances to work in San Francisco, Chicago, New York City, or Delaware. And you're like, oh, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> okay, not, not in a good way. Okay, and so you have to move to a major city where people who are coming out of college or top 5% of their class are like, hey, that'd be a great place to live. So for us, the natural options were the valley, you know, but moving across the country didn't seem so practical because we already had a firm moved to Boston, we weren't thinking New York at the time, moved to Boston where we went to college and there's kind of an interesting startup scene. And DC wasn't really on the map at that point, but I grew up in DC, I'm a Redskins fan, and I had season tickets for the Redskins and made a really strong push for moving to Washington DC. And so I did a, I hosted a trip for a bunch of guys in the company to come down, wine and, wine and dine them, at that point I think that was Coke and hamburgers, but like, you know, wine and dine them, and said, so this would be a great place for us to relocate the company. And so we picked Tyson's Corner, Virginia as a place to relocate. We were 40 people at the time, and I think we got 39 out of 40 people to relocate. Only one person stayed back in Delaware. But we did it for recruiting reasons, because again, we were going to top flight schools, and the people that we wanted to recruit were people who wanted to live in a reasonable city when they graduated college. I mean, this is uh, uh, even above Boston, because I mean, Boston is a great place to recruit. Boston's a great place, but it's cold as hell, and there are no Washington Redskins. And so, fair enough. <laughs> if you're a Cowboys fan, don't talk to me, right? <laughs> um, okay, so I wanted to, um, uh, so two more questions before we do, we open this some Q and A. But uh, can you talk about a little bit of your angel investing, and what are some of the startups that pique your interest? Um, if you're going to write a check today to some startup here in this room. <laughs> what would that be? What would that look like? So uh, uh, angel investing, I would say, is uh, full of pitfalls, uh, I know, uh, in that uh, I've done a bunch. Some have been great hits. Some, some are, have gone to zero. A lot have gone to zero. Uh, in general, I look for a few things, and I think that all people who are investing look for a few things. I, I look for technologies or ideas that are inevitable. So if you look out 10 or 20 years, you say, this idea will happen. I don't know if these guys will make it happen, but I know that this idea is a good enough idea and somebody will make it happen. So I like to bet on ideas that are inevitable. Then number two, I like to bet on A double plus people, like people that have a history of being ridiculously super strong at whatever they've done. 
So I love scholar athletes, guys that have been all-American athletes, that have gone to you know, like top schools and have excelled, or that have done something else amazing in their life where you say, that guy over, or that gal over a period of 20 years has shown unbelievable determination and has risen to the very top, both athletically, drama, acting, you know, act, or, uh, professionally in whatever they've, they've endeavored in. And so uh, there's no doubt entrepreneurship is not a quick hit thing. It takes a long time to build a great company. MicroStrategy, you know, we, we went uh, eight years, no venture financing before we even thought about going public. Cvent, you talked about Reggie Agarwal. Cvent, you guys probably know because it's been in the papers, is on the road this week in their ro IPO roadshow with a plan to go public Friday on the New York Stock Exchange and ring, ring the bell. And that's been 13 years in the making. And uh, I had the benefit of meeting Reggie early on. We were the best of friends. And so I said to him, I said, he was a lawyer at Shaw Pittman, but just a ridiculously talented guy. And I said, yeah, dude, you're way too talented to be a lawyer. No offense to lawyers, but you're way too talented to be a lawyer. You should be running something like upscale. And so I said, I, I, this was when money meant something, 1998, 1999. I wrote him a $300,000 check and said, don't, I'm not asking for anything. Like, this check is for you, just be something. Like, you know, you're better than what you're doing right now, be something. He's like, thanks, but I can't take it from you because I just don't have an idea of what I would do. But he came back six months later and said, I now have an idea, is that offer still good? I was like, of course it is, and just take it. Well, he took it and then ended up giving me a pretty good portion of his company as a result, which was nice of him because I didn't ask for it, but he, he did it anyway. And they're going public this Friday. So I think inevitable ideas with great people are the perfect kind of one-two ingredient for startups. And so that's, that's more than anything what I look for. Great, you know, inevitable idea. It doesn't have to be a great idea, just an ine inevitable idea and then great people. Okay, great. We're going to open the floor up for uh, Q&A. So, um, yeah, so thank you. Uh, thank you for your thoughts tonight. This has been excellent. Um, my name is Mike. Uh, my question is, seems like industry leaders like MicroStrategy look over the horizon and see those inevitable ideas before anybody else does. From your perch in the industry, can you give us a hint on what you see over the horizon right now? As not, big data, of course, is sort of popularized, but is there anything that you see as inevitable beyond that that hasn't quite hit the popular uh, entrepreneurial circuit yet? You know, it's a good question. I'm probably a little bit more myopic than I ought to be, so I probably don't have any huge revelations uh, for you here. Uh, I do think a lot right now about uh, analytics, which is sort of an extension of big data and how people are going to uh, automate uh, the decision-making process and kind of take people out of the loop of decision-making. But in a sense, that's, that's, a, um, that, that, that's not a huge leap from where we are today. Uh, I do think that there's a tremendous amount of potential in mobile technology to change workflow. But again, not a huge leap. People are talking about that uh, more broadly. I do think that there's, um, there's something emerging, which we're all starting to see, but maybe I'll put a, a, a name to it, which is human sensing. And so the idea that we're all going to be wearing sensors that will uh, give off some information about us all the time. So this idea of self-introspection through human sensing I think is incredibly powerful. So if I could know, uh, you know, my lung capacity, my heart rate, my body mass index, kind of all the time, and uh, do it more at a cellular level or at a chemical level, I, I would like to know after I eat a meal how it is that I digest sugar and be able to track it and have it always tracked and then moderate my eating behavior. When I run, I'd like to know what the after effects are when I run. So there's just a lot I'd like to know about me that I barely know. I, I, I have some intuition, but I don't really have data. And so I think that's going to be a very big industry. And you're starting to see it, obviously, with Jawbone and some of these other you know, wrist sensing technologies. But I think uh, we're not too far from having implanted technology, which sounds weird, but it's not that weird. Like I, I would actually like to have an implant of some sort just to give me uh, biochemistry information. All right, next question. Well, thank you. This has been really helpful. I've been taking down my notes. Um, you talked about money, and you talked about product, uh, talked about customer acquisition. Talk about culture. 
for your company. And if you think about what was what 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 was it that you got really right about culture with MicroStrategy, and if you could go back, what would be maybe the one thing you would change about culture? Yeah, you know, I'd say frankly, I miss I miss the uh, the first five or ten years of the MicroStrategy culture. So we're 23 years in, and I don't want to say it's inevitable that culture changes because I don't believe that. But I would say that culture has changed a little bit. And so when I look back in that first five years in particular, the culture was uh, built on people. And I, I do think people make the difference. And recruiting is the big filter here. And so if there's, if there's any one thing I would say is you know, figure out what culture you want and then hold a very high bar in the recruiting cycle to try to get to that culture. And if I, you know, th there's no one thing, but if I were to say what kind of people did we look for, we looked for the uh, scholar athlete, and I, you could substitute actor, athlete, or sorry, the, the, uh, the scholar, actor, the scholar, something else, the scholar, whatever, but scholar plus something else, uh, and people who were ridiculously good at what they did, and who also happened to be reasonably or very social. So that way, you, when you came to work, you're like, I'm going to be with people who are better than the people that are at home. <laughs> And so people were very happy to be around their work colleagues 70, 80, 90 hours a week because the truth is the people you're around at work were going to be better than the people you probably went to school with and you probably went to a tier one school, but the work people were even better. They were more interesting, more social, and better at something outside of all that. And so we worked very, very hard on that culture and we held a very high bar. I personally interviewed the first a uh, thousand employees, which means probably three thousand interviews to get to the first thousand employees at MicroStrategy, maybe even more. Uh, and uh, part of that is just keeping the the people filter very high. So I would say pick a culture. You know that that was ours. Uh, you know, scholar slash something, people who are fun, and then uh, hold to that pretty rigor rigorously. Anything you would change? No, you know, sometimes uh, we self-critique and say we hired a ton of people out of college. We were, we were famous for, you know, we, we had at one point, you know, 100 uh, MIT graduates, 120 Dartmouth graduates, when we were only like 600 people in size. Like, so we weren't even that big, and we had 100 from each one of these schools. But, uh, you know, people will say that's great or not great. I think it was great. I think it was great. So I don't know that I would change that. Okay, next question. Hi. Uh, to follow up on that and their whole recruiting industry, I mean, there is a ton of great talent out there, but how did you find those people or on vice versa? How did they find you? Yeah. And even once they got in the door, you know, granted, people from MIT are very smart, but let's say all resumes look the same. How did you know that that guy that you hired was going to be the right hire? Yeah. So, uh, you know, for the first framing principle is we think of recruiting as sales. So recruiting is not HR, recruiting is sales, which means you're going after people acquisition, which means you have to market, you have to build a funnel, a funnel and you have to sell. And so, uh, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, there were a bunch of folks in one of the MIT labs that were PhD guys very hard to get access to because uh, PhDs, and maybe this is true everywhere, certainly true at MIT, they don't work someplace unless there's already an MIT PhD there before them. So they won't go someplace where there isn't already a, a preceding PhD guy there. And so you got this uh, chicken and egg problem, which is how do you get the first one? <laughs> like it's just a, it's a very hard problem. And so, uh, you know, ultimately you sort of work it, you get the first guy, but these, these are like four or five year long recruiting cycles to try to get the, the culture built up. So now we have some 30 uh, PhD mathematicians kind of at the core of what we do, but they're not easy to get and you just, like you have to work them. I'm not really answering a question, but I would say there are people that I've worked for 10 years to, be, before they joined the firm, consistently marketed and sold them for 10 years before I convinced them that they ought to come. And so uh, you just set a high bar and just keep on working. It's, it's, you know, talent acquisition as sales. We think of it as a sales process. And it's, it's easily the most important thing I do. Okay, next question. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> your information has been very insightful. Um, I'm brand new to startups, so all the entrepreneurs here, I like some cards. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I guess the question I have is being brand new, if you're in my position, would you target just the U.S. market or more global market? Is there a difference? Your insight on it? Hmm. Look, I don't, I don't know what business you're in. I don't know what you do exactly. But uh, the general advice that I give uh, from the entrepreneurs that I have in my, in, in my uh, sphere of influence is get great in the U.S. and get to scale in the U.S. before you go international. Uh, going international is very expensive. There's a lot of redundancy in trying to build international business because you have to reset up legal and accounting and other infrastructure. And so the general rule of thumb I have for my technology portfolio, you know, the guys that, I, that, that, that are in technology, is get to about 100 million in size before you think about going international. And so it's, I, I have a very high bar for what people can do in the US before they go international. And I'd say, you know, maybe get to 100 million and then think about going international. Depends on the business, but in, in technology sales, I'd say kind of get to that, love that threshold uh, before you go outside the US. I think we have time for two more questions. So Dave from Pin Booster. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks so much. This has been really terrific. Uh, I love hearing the story about uh, Facebook and how you started up with them on their sales. It's sort of a problem that we're dealing with um, with Pinterest is how we sell the product, mining our data. Now that you're so big, how do you find or how do smaller companies find you and get in and find you and work with you as a partner or things like that since you're so big? When you were small, do you remember getting in, and how do you work with them in that way? So I think your question is, uh, as a smaller uh, company, how do you break in and start to work with a bigger company? Yeah, yeah. How, how, how do you how do you get in? Um, yeah, any way you can. Uh, and so uh, some some cases, you pick up the phone and call the CEO and say you have a great idea. Oftentimes they won't meet with you, but they'll put you off to somebody else who might meet with you if you have a good pitch. Uh, other times you go in the bottom, other times you use a network connection, you know, LinkedIn or something, and you're going on the side. But uh, there's, no, there's no perfect way. You just uh, you get in any way you can. What's common to all that, though, is have a point. I mean, like, wh when you're going to pitch, <laughs> have a point. It's like, it can't be I want to meet with you. No, no, no. I'm going to make you, save you, do this for you, something. Have, have a very pointed pitch so that when people look at it, they go, oh, there's some insight here. I got to get it to somebody. And so I'd say you know, half the time when we, when we pitch somebody, it's not the person we pitch that ends up buying. They like the pitch enough and they give it to somebody else. So have a pitch that can travel, hopefully short, hopefully very clear. Make sure it travels electronically through an organization. And just to follow up more specifically, MicroStrategy, do you guys look out for, that doesn't even have to be local, but do you keep your eyes open for the next up and comer? Okay. <laughs> MicroStrategies in, in specific, having grown from something so small to something so huge, do you try to keep your eyes open from a corporate perspective, not only an angel investor perspective, on, on how you allow newcomers in and, and try to bring them into the fold? I'm, I'm sure there are many suppliers that are always uh, nipping at our heels trying to get in, and they, they hopefully are creative and they find a way in. But we're not out looking for them. They have to find their way in. Okay, one last question from Paul. Thank you again for coming. Uh, yeah. I had a question. Of all the big data solutions and problems we've seen out there, what haven't you seen solved that you'd like to solve, and, and why? <laughs> uh, where to begin? I mean, there, there, there's, How there's, about a social mission or passion, something that you care deeply about, that if you could think your herald will prey on and draw a solution, big data wasn't that. Sure. Sure, so the question is, uh, in the big data world, what are one or two solution areas that I'd like to go after? So uh, right now, uh, two uh, personal interest areas that, uh, that I am pursuing. Uh, one is uh, uh, whether you like or don't like Obamacare, and I'm not gonna get into the politics of it, I would say the government's about to put five to $10 billion behind getting seven to 10 million uninsured Americans enrolled with insurance. Open enrollment st starts, I think, October 1, so that's about to kick up. They're going to spend 500 to 1,000 bucks per person, the government will, to make sure that people get into the system. It's their number one initiative. And so the question is, in this new world of open enrollment, where they've radically reduced the barrier to entry for getting insurance, how do you get people insured, and how do you make sure they find per appropriate insurance? How do they get c uh, connected? So 
there's a social imperative if you believe in Obamacare. Some people don't, some people do. But if, if, if you do, there's a big problem with a lot of money behind it to get this kind of new era of accountable care and affordable care underway. So that's a social problem, in a sense. Uh, number two, I think there's, um, just, just as there has been with Facebook, um, there's an interesting massive data opportunity, interesting data opportunity at LinkedIn. So LinkedIn has career pathing data for millions of folks, probably 100, 100 million plus folks at this point. And there are some big questions that have been raised recently about the law school market, but it applies more generally, which is, if you go to law school, will you have a better life or not a better life than if you didn't go to law school? Because the jury's still out for a lot of lawyers as to whether or not they're better off having gone to law school. And if so, which law schools yield better returns? And what are the career paths that lawyers tend to go through depending on where they went to school and what kind of firm they went to when they graduate? Well, that's the legal market, which has gotten a little bit of focus lately because it's been a soft market. But the issue is true for any kind of education. You know, if I go, went to a public school or a private school, you know, a lot of people in the suburbs, you talk to my friends who have kids, uh, they spend a crazy amount of money sending their kids to private school, you know, 15, 20,000 bucks a year for eight or 10 years. And you think, does it make a difference? They're all convinced it might make a difference, but there's no data to prove that it does or that it doesn't. And so it'd be nice to have these longitudinal studies that say, if you were educated in this way, if you went to this kind of school, if you majored in this, these are the range of outcomes and the probability is that this will happen. LinkedIn has that data. <laughs> they do have that data. For better or for worse, they've got it. And so if we could find a way to get to it, mine it, and then provide that out as a social good, that would be an interesting big data societal problem so to solve. Just to follow on that, sorry. So if someone had an idea or a business model that could monetize what you just described, but if you had an ability to call, oh, I don't know, the guy that heads up and ask them if you could use this data, you could possibly just solve the problem you described. Would that be an interesting idea? Yeah, if you, if, if you know Jeff Weiner and he'll give you access to his proprietary APIs, and uh, then, then there, there's definitely room to talk. I think he's talking about a startup. <laughs> we'll, we'll have time for uh, uh, more questions off offline, but we have, we're going to wrap this up. But yeah. um, two last questions. So one is, well, this is the one. So if you were a young entrepreneur sitting here in the audience, uh, what is the most important advice you would give to yourself? Uh, my experience is it's all people. I mean, uh, uh, everything else is secondary. Pick people who are crazy, wicked, smart, and will work their asses off to work with you, for you, above you in anything that you do. And what I mean by that is, you know, get guys that are top 1%, get guys that, you know, will work 90 hours a week. Because it's not the idea. The truth is, you know, we've iterated at MicroStrategy through three or four ideas to get to something that works. It's never the idea because the idea will morph, it'll turn into something else, and you need people smart enough to look around the corners and see what the idea will become. But it's people who are crazy smart and crazy dedicated um, that make the difference. So it's, it's all about people, which is why, probably for me, the number one issue is just it's, it's recruiting. How do you get the right people in? OK, and one last question, and this is probably the most important question we always ask. <laughs> so you ready? So who is your favorite superhero or historic figure and why? Uh, historic figure. Uh, I have, uh, uh, not just because I'm Indian, I have some, some admiration for uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, the, the, as, a, as a parable for an entrepreneur, think about somebody that has no resources, literally no resources, and takes on the most powerful nation on the face of the earth in order to get independence. Okay no resources. That's what it's like being an entrepreneur. And that's willpower, that's dedication, that's power of persuasion every single day. And so you just got to find a way to tap into what people want to believe in and make them believe. It's, it's, it's critical if you're an entrepreneur. So obviously you told me this answer. And uh, well, usually what I do is I go on eBay to find an action figure if I could. <laughs> I didn't find an action figure of Gandhi, but I did find a bobblehead. Right? <laughs> So, there you go. Great, thank you. All right, you. ladies and gentlemen, Sanjay's concept. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.